Thank you very much, Simon. Greatly appreciate it. Okay, so to the point Simon made, I mean, it is a beaten down sector now. You know, the global property index is down 30% year to date. The SA sector has also fared pretty badly. I think it's down about 17, 18% year to date. Most asset classes are down year to date. Um, and that really is sometimes where the opportunity lies, if for no good reason, um, besides rising US Fed funds rate, um, these things happen, but the operational dynamics underpinning it remain quite robust and quite strong. So let me just move one thing out of the way here. I can see a bit better. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, cool. Right. So if I put it to you this way, I think let's just look at the history very quickly of what's happened in the sector. Um, if you look at the last uh, 19 years, okay, there's only four times the sector has gone negative. In 2008, it was a global financial crisis. In 2018, it was a lot of research reports coming out questioning the sustainability of the earnings. Um, and then in 2020, obviously, it was COVID. And then year to date, we've had the Fed hiking rates. You know, peak inflation was in Feb, then it was in March, then it was in June. Now it's September, October, higher US CPI prints than expected. And really, this is what's driving the SA bond yield to 11 and a quarter and the US Fed fund rates to almost 4%. And this is the dynamic knocking the sector down, not the operational performance, which if you take the last five years where the companies have gone through rebasing, restoring balance sheets, strength, bright sizing the tenants, they fixed a lot of the issues that guys had. I mean, this, this highlights it quite well, the smarty box look here. At the bottom of the tab's table, at the bottom there, we have the GDP growth for South Africa year after year. Now that 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007 period where we had very strong type of GDP growth, you could see the sector deliver phenomenally strong returns in the 40s to 26% range. Um, where we are right now, if you look on the far right and the forecast for the next couple of years is for a very muted GDP growth outlook. What I want to make the point very strongly is that the property sector has prepared itself for a very weak outlook, given what it's done over the last five years with COVID, et cetera. Um, if you look at that table, the fascinating thing for me is that purple block at the top is cash. In 2022 year to date, cash is the best performing asset class. It has never been the best performing asset class in uh, probably about um, two decades. And I think really that just, you know, cash is dollar strength coming through and, and guys really being very risk averse in this interest rate hiking environment. So let's just look at the outlook quickly. You know, I, I'm actually at the Sapoa conference right now and I, there's a couple of things that stand out for me. Um, talking to a lot of the property managers and property management teams there out here, they're making the point that, you know, you are starting to see some element of stabilization in vacancies in the market. Um, retail is starting to perform a bit better. Reversions are still negative, but less negative than they have been in recent years. <clears throat> so a lot, of, a lot of positive dynamics coming through telling me that to some extent the sector has found a base or is close to finding a base coming forward. Um, we're not looking for strong growth in earnings. We're looking at a couple of percent at best. But there is sufficient support there with a very high income return of almost 10% yield from the sector now to justify in the next 12 months the sector delivering almost a 14% return. As I said, a large component of that will be income um, and a small component will be capital. A lot of that capital return will obviously be dependent on where the bond yield goes. Um, so that is obviously the key risk to the sector. I mean, if you felt this year that load shedding has been bad, you're not wrong. I mean, this year has been particularly bad given recent years. The key problem we're facing now really is the impact this has on the GDP growth of the country and in, in relation to that, what it has on the property sector. Now, you know, stage six prolonged GDP growth is a very bad situation. Stage one and two costs hundreds of millions of a day, rands a day. Stage six is where you enter the billions, I believe, um, of cost to the economy. Um, but I also want to make the point, you know, that <clears throat> the sector has in the past five years gone through evaluation concerns. It's gone through COVID. It's now at load shedding state six. And let's, let's be clear, you know, I mean, since 2008, when load shedding started, it's been about 
14, 12 years and we still haven't fixed the issue. So it's getting worse and worse. Property companies have prepared for this since 2008, obviously not to the extent of load shedding we see now, but they have put in place plans on diesel generators, on solar, et cetera, to help mitigate it as best they can. There's no doubt, however, that this level of load shedding <coughs> is negative for the sector, business confidence and sentiment towards the sector. This slide just highlights the point here that new shopping centers on the left, a lot of it is coming up in the smaller towns, rural areas. Less development happening in the big CBDs, and that's because you know the metros are very saturated in this dynamic. On the right hand side, we just make the point that office, sorry, not office, retail um, reversions on expiring leases are better than what you are seeing in, in office stall. Um, but it is asset dependent. I mean, resilient there at the bottom, showing positive numbers for the last few years, whereas a growth point or a re redefine with a more mixed retail offering is showing a balance of negative numbers um, together with some positives. <coughs> this slide just highlights that the office properties completed have slowed down a lot in recent years. Talking of the story that the oversupply dynamic needs to be absorbed, but it's a very GDP linked asset class office. And it's gonna be dependent on good GDP growth for the next few years for office to be absorbed. In terms of escalations in the sector, we're now sitting at about 6.77%. No one is signing leases below a 6% escalation. Um, but I think it's important to note that, you know, we're not dropping below the 6% level in my thinking and in our expectations. That's quite important in terms of driving rental growth for the next couple of years and to help offset the large administered costs that are coming through. <coughs> Excuse me. If I look at this table here showing the SA property reversions, you'll see that lower class LSM, community shopping centers, logistics and storage are seeing positive reversions on expiring leases. It's really the super regional centers and the office where the pain is still very much being felt in aggregate in the sector. We think that is to some element going to start basing more and more. Um, and in a few years, given that office has for the last seven years been seeing negative reversions, we think in a couple of years, we're gonna start seeing that flatten out to zero and start going positive. This slide really highlights the problem with the administered costs coming through, running at very high single digits on rates, taxes, electricity, municipal charges. The picture on the right is quite horrific, the way that has increased month on month or in year on year since 2001 versus other cost elements. I think the key thing to note here is with at least the rental line, the top line growing because of a 6% escalation on 80% roughly of leases and 20% of leases reverting negatively a couple of percent. <clears throat> Even <clears throat> with this cost growth coming through, we are still able to show in aggregate positive distribution growth from the sector. This situation, however, of cost rising at this level cannot continue forever. And at some point it needs to be addressed and uh, brought under control, either through lobbying or negotiations uh, and discussions with the government and the municipalities. I think the other point to make is, in recent years, the loan to value of the sector has been a concern. That is not even a discussion point anymore, with a lot of investors very comfortable that asset impairments in terms of materiality have now started to, to lessen, and that the companies are comfortably geared below the 40% level, which is where most investors have comfort between the 35 to 40% range. If you look at NAV assumptions, you'll see that we are expecting negative NAV growth for the next year. However, saying that, from the conference I'm at, most guys are indicating to me that I might be positively surprised, and that NAVs might be stronger than I anticipate in terms of growth for the next 12 months. If we are talking property, we can't ignore the higher bond yield and the pressure that puts on the sector. The key things coming through for me are as following. The banks are seeing the property companies as having better quality debt 
and are willing to reduce their refinancing margins rather than increasing the overall cost of debt that they offer the property companies. The sector is positioned to absorb, we believe, 1% to 2% of cap rate expansion if it was to emerge, without LTVs becoming a concern. What is also anchoring the sector to a large extent is that with building inflation coming through at very high levels on steel, cement, copper, um, these type of elements that are key to uh, building large commercial buildings, um, it is supporting asset valuations. There's also been a shortage of new property supply and existing properties are starting to benefit from tenants looking at taking exposure to property assets but unable to find new supply in the market. We also expect that the higher to lower bond yield shift, which is expected to happen some point late next year, will be important in terms of driving capital growth in the sector. And we note the disconnect between the public and private market. The public market being the listed sector, the private market being the unlisted sector, where yields are much lower and assets traded much closer to book value. The concerns with a higher bond yield are obviously that cap rates will move up materially. I just want to make the point that this is looking at the bond yield in the red dotted line back to 1988. It makes the point that there is no one-to-one -one relationship between cap rates and bond yields. Bond yields are, will drop or rise over time, and then depending on the buyer and seller market that evolves post that, cap rates will move accordingly. It doesn't necessarily mean that if interest rates have moved up massively or bond yields have moved up a lot, that property cap rates will move up accordingly. We are seeing a lot of stability in cap rates right now, having noted that through COVID, they have already moved up quite significantly. This slide just talks about the fact that given that during COVID, a lot of companies withheld their dividend, the correlation on the left shows you that property and bonds have historically had a very high correlation. That has now broken down. And the correlation is very much more to equities. As the, bond, as the property sector has always been viewed as a quasi-bond equity in terms of its characteristics, with the removal of the dividend in recent years, um, the equity characteristics were much more highly valued. Hence, the correlation went up on that side. <clears throat> the other point to make is property companies have now all resumed their dividends and given guidance in many cases for the next 12 to 24 months. Given that's now becoming evident, I would expect the correlation of the sector to the bond yield to start increasing over time as it now becomes viewed as more of a bond proxy rather than an equity proxy. Then looking on the right, you can see the volatility of the sector has gone through the roof in recent years, in part due to the fact that it has started withholding dividends and now is resumed paying dividends again. <coughs> Excuse me. This slide makes the point that cap rates have moved up in recent years, and rule the forecasts are for cap rates in the medium term to start declining. I wouldn't expect them to start declining. I would be happy if they maintain these type of levels, um, given a very weak growth outlook for the country. So when I talk of a disconnect between the public and private market, what I'm talking about is the fact that stocks like growth point out on a 10, 11% yield, redefined on an almost 14% yield. And in the private market, the underlying assets behind these type of companies were traded 8% yields. Property management teams are becoming increasingly frustrated that they're trading at about half book value in many cases. There is no real operational solution until the macro corrects. With U.S. Treasuries at almost 4%, we need these numbers to start coming down and normalizing once inflation is brought under control, which will then result in the property sector, the listed one at least, showing very strong positive capital returns. The operational dynamics behind the listed property sector are very solid on the outlook. It is the bond yield dynamic and the interest rate dynamic where it is right now that is keeping them under pressure. To what I just said, this is very important. If you look at the forward dividend yield in the second column on the left, you'll see the very high yields on a lot of the stocks. Yield is what is driving the sector right now. If you look at the spot price to book, the second column from the right, you'll see stocks at 0 0.6, 0 0.5 book, um, some as low as 0.37 book if you look at attack. 
If you look at the NAV yield on the right-hand side, what we're saying there is if you put the price at NAV and you ignore the share price of the stock in the market, what is the yield on the NAV of the companies? And you'll see that would be 6% for growth point, for example, 8% for redefine. Now, with bond yields at 11 and a quarter in South Africa, growth point is not going to trade on a 6% yield anytime soon. Um, we need a normalization of that bond yield dynamic to come through, and then these stocks will re-rate accordingly to a much more higher type of NAV level. Again, I want to make the point, we're not expecting these stocks to go to 1.5 book, 1.4 book. We expect them to go to 0 0.8, 0 0.85 book. Um, still trading at a discount to the underlying value, and the underlying value of the assets, but we think there's good upside once the yields start to come down on the bond and the Fed fund over time. This slide just makes the point here that if you look at the optimal mix from, this is a slide from Anchor Securities, the optimal mix of property in a balanced fund would, should be around 12%. It's currently sitting at 4%. So quite a, quite a low allocation. It has been low for many years, having been at its highest in probably around 2017. Uh, at six percent before the issues started arising in 2018, 2019 on concerns on on distribution sustainability. What is very important for me when I look at the sector price to book is how it translates to distribution growth and yield. Companies have started giving guidance more and more. Earnings are supposed expected to grow in the sector, and the price to book of the sector has been pretty stable between. 0.8 and 0.7 for a while now. So what's been happening is the distribution yield has continued to roll up in the sector and grow. The sector is currently on about a 10% yield with the bond at 11 and a quarter. Given a few more months of the, of the income yield rolling up into the sector, I would expect to see the sector start showing positive returns somewhere in mid-2023. <clears throat> This just highlights the fact that with the sector trading at a discount to book value, you can see that it's been very hard to raise equity to do capital asset transactions. You'll also see a, a very little office volume transactions coming through in recent years. But post 2018, 2019, it's really the fact that the sector is trading at a discount to its book value that makes it very hard to raise equity um, in order to do transactions. Also, as you remember, you know, debt hasn't really been an opportunity to, to use because companies have been in a de-gearing phase as well. So they've been very averse to going to debt as a method of funding growth. This slide just highlights where a lot of the capital has gone in recent years. It makes the point that, you know, 2016, 17, 18, we saw a lot of capital go to CE, Western Europe, and the United Kingdom. They've been able to still do acquisitions in 2019 and 2020, in part here because the stocks with exposure to those markets have been trading close to book value, even in recent times. So that's allowed them to continue expanding overseas, whereas companies with only an SA property portfolio have struggled to continue to do acquisitions or growth from an from acquisitive side. So this really sums up the local property sector and how it's positioned for a weak SA macro outlook. In the last five years, we've had two years of concerns on earning sustainability, and uh, valuations, followed by two years of COVID. Those two years of COVID have resulted in rebasing of earnings. It's resulted in valuation declines. It's resulted in, in companies looking at reducing the LTVs even further. And what it's resulted in is those three points on the right hand side. Balance sheet strength is restored. Income levels have been rebased. Income growth potential has been repurposed for with the right tenant mix. And we think the sector is really positioning itself well to start delivering low double-digit returns um, with even higher short-term capital returns when bond and rates normalize at lower levels. Um, we think the challenges and risks are well understood in the sector right now. And then we think over the long term, you're going to really see the income return dominate the total return picture, but capital return should return to be a couple of percent on top of a high yield from the sector. That's the local sector run through. Looking at the global sector, the global sector finds itself in an even stronger position. The gross asset value to debt dynamics are very low. The EBITDA to EV dynamics are very attractive. 
the US in particular is looking as a very strong market. We're looking at multifamily, logistics, healthcare, um, so storage, etc. A lot of more companies are offering free cash flow yields of over 10% in those markets. Um, we would expect team type of returns from the global property market on a medium term view. Also to make the point, you know, the global property sector is down 30% year to date in dollars. A lot of that has been driven by this interest rate hike that's continued throughout the year. As you know, property is a late cycle play. It also struggles going into interest rate hikes and performs well in the months after the interest rate hikes have come, have, have already happened. Um, so where we are right now is, you know, we are looking at positioning a portfolio on the global side, taking advantage of companies with short dated leases, able to adjust for inflation, and taking advantage of companies with pricing power, such as logistics. <coughs> this slide highlights in ZAR terms, the second largest drawdown in global property has happened this year, year to date. Since 2003, there have only really been about five or six years where the sector has returned negative numbers in some. The average return has been mid-teens, which is what we would anticipate is appropriate from the sector. So uh, there was a conference we attended in September on, on global property, years, particularly on U.S. stocks. A couple of things became very evident from it. Property is viewed as very much as a sector with inflation problems for inflation protection characteristics, there is no evidence of weakening demand. And that's quite a bold statement to make. The reason for that is this recession is not being preceded by an oversupply of property. We've been through COVID. We've been through many dynamics that have mopped up a lot of property, st property assets in the market. This, re this potential recession is being driven by too much liquidity since 2008 being introduced by the Fed. And, and other central banks. <clears throat> so it's more of a macro story, and it's not being driven by a housing oversupply dynamic or commercial property oversupply dynamic in the market. We're seeing senior housing, healthcare, um, turning positive for the first time in a decade. Residential, particularly the US market, multi-story, multi-family apartments is looking very attractive. There's a continuing a structural undersupply of these assets in that market. Industrial and self-storage continue to do very well. Office REITs are on about a 10% forward yield, free cash flow. Um, again, you know, normally when you go into a recession, office will get hammered. This recession, office has already been hammered for the last two to three years with COVID. So it should see less of a downturn than has historically been the case and should come out of it in an even better position. The evidence we're seeing in the U.S., is that people are returning to work um, and a work from home dynamic is becoming less evident. There's also a very strong view in the market that a recession, if it were to happen, will make people value their jobs much more. The labor market is starting to soften. And what that means is that more people will go into the office as the importance of being seen and being seen at work is, important, is relevant when you have to value your job in a recessionary environment. The other point, as I said, is that you know cap rates and interest rates do not move at the same rate of a one-to-one. -one. Higher cap rates do not necessarily mean lower values in the sector, particularly given if inflation comes through, the net operating income will go up. This slide just makes the point that you know post a recession on the right hand side, if you look at those gray areas which are historic recessions, property tends to do very well, and if you look at the left hand side top table, the rent growth. Office typically underperforms on rent growth in a recession. But as I said, we're going into this recession, if there is to be one, um, with office already having seen two years of COVID in its balance sheet and in, in the mix of its rentals. I mean, this just highlights a question posed to a lot of property stocks or property management teams in terms of what type of cap rate expansion would you expect? Only in family and apartments, were a few respondents of the view that they would see more than 50 basis points of expansion. In most instance, instances, the view was that it was in a large component of cap rate expansion. And demand underpinning the assets, be it in self-storage, 
um, industrial, multifamily apartments remains quite strong with very little evidence of a slowdown, even though the, the Fed has hiked to this point. The other point to be made is a lot of the property companies have hedges in place on a multi-year view on a large component of their debt. They are not currently being impacted on the refinance side by where the interest rates are. If the interest rates globally were to fall in the next couple of years, these property companies might have weathered the, the increase in interest rates without ever having to tap the market at these higher rates and start benefiting in two or three years from lower interest rates again. <clears throat> this slide just makes the point that after an increase in the Fed funds rate on the right-hand side, let's say 12 months afterwards, you see REITs perform very well versus the US market on average. Obviously, going into the, into the hiking dynamic, property 12 months preceding that will tend to underperform. This slide just makes the point that, you know, we have seen a massive drawdown in US REITs, the largest drawdown since the global financial crisis has come through. The sector is priced on a price to FFO basis at a very attractive level. Payout ratios are lower at around the 70% level, allowing companies to manage their dividend payments. Um, and also we've noticed a high level of private equity targeting real estate from all the data that we're seeing globally right now. You know, if you contrast the growth in NOI, net operating income, for many of these global property sectors compared to SA, they are far superior in many instances. You'll see there the 2023 numbers. This is updated as of last week. Um, seeing very strong growth rates coming through um, in many of these, of these subsectors. Industrial, almost 7%. Single family rentals at the 10% level. Um, healthcare at the 8% level, lodgings also very strong. So you're seeing uh, also in apartments, 9%, very strong growth rates and income expected from many of the subsectors to which we've taken exposure. The longer dated stuff, um, such as your, your um, data centers are at 4%, um, ground leases at 2%. Obviously, those with very long leases in place are unable to benefit from the higher inflation environment. A lot of these companies have been able to benefit, however, um, and pass it on to the tenant. And the one dynamic coming through in the U.S., which is very powerful for us, is wage inflation is starting to emerge. That is not something we're seeing in Europe to the same extent. And that gives us a lot of comfort that if the tenant is seeing an ability to pay more, the landlord is able to ask more. Um, again, that's not a situation that's so easily evident in the UK right now, given energy poverty to some extent, and obviously higher mortgage costs coming through in recent days um, with the moves they've made on gilts and uh, and Fed fund and sorry and, and interest rates. <clears throat> the slide just makes the point here that you know the the sector is going into maybe a recession or an interest rate hiking environment with a very low debt to asset value compared to history. The slide goes back to 2006, taking into account even the global financial crisis. As I said, on the right hand side there, the payout ratio is low. The companies are able to control and maintain their dividends and all of them are seeing strong demand continuing um, for the underlying assets from tenants. Looking at the valuations here, I mean, the property spread, it's all about the bonds is the point of the slide here. Um, the spread has been driven down because of U.S. 10 years yields going up, not because of a material shift in U.S. REIT dividend yields. So U.S. REIT dividend yields haven't come down. If anything, they've moved up given where the share prices have moved in recent weeks. Um, again, making it quite attractive, even with a very tight spread between the two coming through. Again, here also just to make the point on the NAV discount, you can see where the sector is trading globally at pretty much one of its largest discount points right now. If you look at it on a debt uh, EBITDA to EV multiple on the right hand side, um, you'll see that the sector is also very attractively positioned here. <clears throat> Looking at price to distributable earnings on a 15 year average, you can see the sector is not overpriced. Um, and the US REITs are trading at that average with even though they have much stronger fundamentals. 
On a price to book basis, you know, this is looking just at the US. <coughs> we make the point here that if you look at the 084, the floor right now that we're seeing going into these hikes in interest rates um, is as steep as it has been at the global financial crisis. May 2020 was obviously COVID, which was a very steep and one-off event with a very rapid recovery post that as well. Looking at European REITs, just to make the point here, you look, if you're looking at 0809, you can see that the sector where it is trading now at a discount to book value is very similar to a lot of the steepest dis points at which it has traded historically. Um, you look at markets here like Italy, um, trading at massive discounts of almost 0.3 book right now is where those, some of those markets are, with many of these European markets trading at steep discounts to their book value. The slide here just makes the point again that, you know, if you're looking at the discount to book value of the continent or you're looking at the UK, they have tracked each other to some extent. The UK, unfortunately, given its Brexit dynamics, et cetera, has traded at a deeper discount for longer, if you go back to 2015 onwards. Um, but both of them are looking compelling and attractive at current levels. Looking at Japan, another market we have exposure to, we just make the point that with the Bank of Japan in a position where it is unable or unwilling to hike its interest rates, um, in the short term, the yen is likely to lose more ground versus the dollar. Um, but the dividend yield spread, as guys look for these assets, remains quite attractive, with them active, trading on a yield here of around about, I think it's about 2-3%. This slide just looks at the fact that the global markets, and I've highlighted before, before to you now, um, have priced in a large component of cap rate expansion. Again, the underlying demand behind the assets remains very strong. And even with cap rate expansion coming through, we don't believe the sector will see material declines in devaluations. We've been through this slide already a bit earlier. It's very similar to the one you saw. And then just in the conclusion running through it, you know, we really are in an environment now where we need to see some element of comfort that the Fed has hiked as high as it is going to hike. Once that type of evidence emerges um, and there's some stability in the, in the Fed fund rate at, at whatever level they deem appropriate, we should see property start to reassert its underlying fundamentals on the global side and start performing positively. As I said, this is quite an unusual cycle we're in, in that given what COVID has done to the sector in the last few years, we're not entering the sector with an oversupply condition in most asset classes. And in multifamily apartment and housing in the US, we are still seeing a massive undersupply. As interest rates continue to rise and people have to either give up their homes or foreclose or look at what is attractive going forward, many people are adopting an asset light model where they prefer to rent than own. And that feeds very strongly into housing demand in the US and a lot of property companies that have that type of exposure. Okay, that is me, gentlemen and ladies. Um, I'm going to see if I can just open up the window here to see if there are any questions. Uh, um, can you guys all hear? Yeah, uh, that's fine. I'll get the questions. I've had a couple sent through to me already. Um, Stambisa asks, and you touched on it a little bit right up front, but I mean, it's fair to say that, I mean, the, 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 not even pre-pandemic, if we go back to sort of 2017, 2018 is when local property uh, 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 peaked. And that the, the sector locally is in a significantly better place, uh, lower LTVs, they've got rid of some of the assets they didn't particularly want, trading below NAVs, just from a valuation perspective, a lot better than it was uh, uh, five years ago when it was arguably quite overvalued, certainly in the local space. Yeah, I think that that's a very, very valid comment. You know, what tells me that to a large extent is this picture here, where... <clears throat> If you take a year like 2015, um, property delivered 13, 14% in those years. In the preceding years to that, 26% growth, 14% growth, 35% growth. I mean, it was growing on capital basis with obviously some income growth and more like at the 10% level and with very weak GDP growth coming through. So there's definitely an argument, and I agree with it to be made, 
that the sector was overvalued to some extent. And what's happened in the last five years is a lot of that is now washed out. And, you know, as I said, the three R's, they've rebased the income streams, they've right-sized the tenant mixes, they've restored the balance sheet credibility, and they're entering what is a very weak GDP growth expectation for the next three years with portfolios that are very defensively positioned. Obviously, the big risk is obviously that this GDP growth disappoints us further. And rather than seeing one and a half to 2%, I mean, ESCOM, I think in the last GDP quarterly print of negative 0.7% that just came out, I think ESCOM was the reason for that negative 0.7. So if we have load shedding for the next 12 to 18 months, these GDP numbers will be revised up. But I also want to make the point, the property sector has been preparing for this type of dynamic for a long time. It obviously won't perform very well, but it should perform very stably in that type of environment. Yeah. Question came through to me, which is my favorite property stock. I, I as a rule, uh, do, do do REITs via, via funds. Uh, one exception is I, I own some storage, but I see it's the one in the, in the one slide you pulled up there, which is which is perhaps the little more expensive. Uh, another question coming from Stambi. So do you have a, a preferred sector in, in, in the US? Locally, uh, our, our, our sort of subsectors within REITs are... are, are not that wide. I mean, in the US, you've got you've got towers, you've got a uh, uh, data centers. Do you have a preferred subsector in the REIT space in the US? Look, I mean, there's very much a consensus overweight sector in the US right now, and that sector would be multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. It would be housing in other dynamics, but single family rentals, 10.3% growth coming through. Apartment, 9% coming through. Um, those are some of the very preferred, very consensus overweight sectors. In particular, apartment is very preferred. The reason being that if you enter a recessionary type of environment that's quite steep, um, apartments are very affordable um, compared to having to rent a single family house type of thing. Um, there's also, look, I think also what we've seen in the last few years is almost 15, 20% growth coming through on rentals in one or two years on, sing on apartments. Um, and as I said, you know, the wage inflation dynamic, which is coming through positively in the yeah. US, is allowing you to pass it on to the tenant. Um, not so evident in, the, in Europe, that type of wage inflation, which you need um, to be able to, to, to get the, in fact, just to give you a point, I just spoke to someone today who's got a flat in London, and he was telling me, you know, with, um, with energy poverty, the, the cost of uh, electricity going up and mortgage rates now going up, he can't pass on an increase to his tenant. It's just, you know, he's always passed one on historically. Now he can't. So it's, it's changing that European dynamic a bit. It's staying in the UK for a moment. There's a question from Karen around the UK, and in, in particular, she mentions Capco. You know, Capco under 20 rand, which is what? A, it's a pound. I, I, you know, it goes to the old cliche, which is property. They're not making any more of it, and Capco has some of the best of it. Is there some some speculative possibility in the UK? Because they've got challenges with 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 Brexit, with their their five year, with their 30 year hit five percent and then four percent, and it's a bit of a wild space right now. So Capco has got Covent Garden in central London, which is kind of like our Sandton city. It's iconic. It's never for sale. Um, it trades on a really low cap rate. And as you know, uh, Capco just did a transaction with Shaftesbury. So now that whole precinct is working together to generate as much synergy as possible. We like Capco. We think it's a good company. But in terms of valuation and growth going forward, we don't see a lot of catalysts um, to drive growth very far from here. Um, Hammerson is looking quite interesting at these levels. I think it's trading at about 16, 18 P right now. In mm -hmm. fact, it's interesting. It, 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 it's fallen so much here to date that I think in recent weeks with uh, what happened in the UK, everything else got smashed in the property sector there except Hammerson <laughs> because it was already, it was already kind of priced, I think, for what, what's happened to the other stocks right now. Uh, and then a question that I actually got uh, watched up to me yesterday uh, that the person's not going to be able to, it wasn't able to attend, but they'll catch the video when we put it up online later this evening. Have you got sort of two or three preferred uh, uh, REITs on the local on the JSC? Or is it a, a sense of, I mean, you showed that slide a moment ago. Is it a sense of, I mean, there is just so much value out there that it's almost agnostic or is it never agnostic in your life? 
No, I mean, look, you know, you, you, you can, obviously the idea is to drain out performance by selecting the better stocks in the sector. So, I mean, just I will saying what the positioning is, I'll just give you some of my names, names which are of interest to me. So, I mean, look, when you're in this type of cycle, owning diversified property funds doesn't a lot of upside potential. But you tend to see the positive, it's positive, very strongly positive. So a stock like a growth point or a redefine um, would struggle to perform very strongly. What people do is they go for storage, which is 50% SA, 50% UK, yeah. very strong demand still behind that. They'll go for, it's not on the slide, it's something like Spear, which is Western mm -hmm. Cape uh, exposure, a lot of semigration coming through there good numbers coming through. They'll take exposure to equities, which is logistics in SA and in the UK. That stuff is holding its value. I mean, long dated leases, um, sterling income as well, doing well. Bukile with Spain and SA on retail, SA community retail. So look, guys will cherry pick and develop a, a portfolio where they've got their community shopping center, they've got their logistics, they've got their Spanish retail, which is doing quite well still. Um, and they'll try and stay away from stuff that owns a lot of stuff but nothing specific because the outlook is such that you want to be defensive and uh, there's, there's a few names here where yield plus growth will get you i would hope um maybe into the team type of returns over time which is what what you'd be looking for from the sector Piers asking particularly about Cirrus. I, I mean, if, if I'm remembering, are they the German guys? Well, they're not the German guys, but they got the German operations where they do a lot of stuff in SME. And, and recently, I think, if I recall, did an acquisition into the UK. Yes, they did an acquisition in the UK. Um, I think what, what's what's fascinating about Sirius is it's got a London listing, S R E L N. It's got an SA listing. And I think it's earnings are in euros, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Last time I checked it was. So it's got sterling, czar, and listings, and euros. Um, look, I think what's happened with Sirius is it was a 30 rand share price going into December 2020, yeah. 20, start of the year. Um, now it's at about 13 bucks. Um, the guidance is the same from what it was at the start of the year. I think the guys are valuing it very much on a UK yield basis. Now, its operations are still very much German, not UK. So I think guys are overdoing the way the stock is, is being pummeled. Um, and it's definitely one that comes up in many discussions, is one where guys are very curious about the right entry point. Um, my view on these type of stocks and these type of environments is you don't want to catch a falling knife. Yeah. And a lot of stocks out there are falling knives. You'd rather wait for some evidence of a turnaround coming through a bottoming, let's call it, and then you would look more and more interestingly at maybe buying it, even if you miss the first five to ten percent. There's also an issue with Sirius where there's a lot of selling coming through from potentially one or two of the big asset managers in it, who maybe view the capital growth story as being done, um, given its UK exposure. And until that type of selling works its way through the system, um, you're probably not going to see very strong upside from there. But I, I at least not point. until. Yeah, and I, I want to reiterate is the the falling knife story. Uh, and you know, just look at a chart. You don't have to be an expert technical analyst. You can start seeing when it when it's not falling, when it's not quite so scary, and you will miss some of that upside. But uh, truthfully, you'll keep all your fingers. And, and I think that's always the you know, the key point as investors. We need our fingers. I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, so we will park it there, uh, folks. We have got the next uh, three power hours. We've got one in two weeks with Chantal Marks, uh, November 3 with uh, Craig Gradage BEE, and then year end 1 December. We'll look forward to 2023. Uh, but Ahmed Matwara of Sanlib, really appreciate your time today. Uh, thank you for struggling through with the technical issues. Uh, Sikhle is a genius. He got us working um, with, with a hack that I had never, ever thought of. But I really appreciate everyone's time this evening. Thanks for having me. Thank you, guys. Everyone, uh, stay safe, look after yourself. As always, if you can, look after someone else as well. Cheers, all.